Hi, and good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System. My name is Elizabeth Waite. I'm a program coordinator with the National Integrated Drought Information System. And today we're going to take a look at two tools that support drought monitoring, the Integrated Water Portal and the Climate Toolbox. In this webinar, I'll share a brief overview of the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. And then Rebecca Ward will present on the Integrated Water Portal. Rebecca is a native to coastal North Carolina. And as the North Carolina Assistant State Climatologist, her work focuses on understanding how North Carolina's weather and climate influences various sectors within the state, such as agricultural and natural resources, and sharing this knowledge with North Carolinians. Her research activities include researching effective ways to communicate drought information to different sectors. She is also a member of the North Carolina Drought Management Advisory Council, and she participates in technical team calls to assess the state's drought status. Rebecca works closely with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension to research, develop, and deliver climate-informed resources that support agricultural decisions. She also provides training to extension agents and their partners and stakeholders on North Carolina's weather, climate, and climate change. Beginning in 2017, Rebecca began pursuing a PhD in science education, also at North Carolina State, with a focus on how individuals learn about and perceive risk from natural hazards. In addition to diving into the integrated water portal today, Rebecca will share with us results of a survey of users of the portal. And then after we learn about the integrated water portal, Dr. Catherine Hegovich will share with us the climate toolbox. Catherine is a research scientist at the University of Idaho, where she's worked for climatologist Dr. John Abatsuglu for the last nine years. She received her PhD in physics at Washington State University and also has degrees in applied math and statistics. Her primary climate research has been in the downscaling of future climate projections but she recently has been creating climate web applications to increase the accessibility of big climate and remote sensing data, most notably as a developer of the Climate Toolbox and Climate Engine. And we're pleased also to have Jeff Marty share with us how he uses the Climate Toolbox for state level drought monitoring. Jeff is an environmental planter, planner and drought coordinator with the Washington Department of Ecology in Olympia, Washington. He led the recent update of the Washington State Drought Contingency Plan. This year, the Washington State Legislature incorporated key recommendations of the drought plan into new legislation that strengthened Washington State drought framework so that it's more supportive of drought resiliency rather than only emergency drought response. The legislation also authorized the Department of Ecology to issue formal drought advisories, whereas previously there was only a drought emergency option. Jeff chairs the State Water Supply Availability Committee, which monitors and forecasts water supply and drought conditions. After these presentations, we will open the webinar for your questions. Throughout the webinar, all participants are muted. So if you have a question for the speakers, please write your question in the question box in the GoToMeeting control panel. And finally, today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on drought.gov. So a little bit about NIDIS. Uh, NIDIS was created by congressional law in 2006 with a mandate to help the nation prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought by establishing a national drought early warning system. NIDIS achieves that goal through the development of regional drought early warning systems. Those are shown on the map here on your screen. And in those regions, networks of partners and stakeholders support communities to prepare for drought. NIDIS also supports research to improve drought predictions, forecasting and monitoring, as well as effective drought planning and preparedness. And all of our work is done in collaboration with a wide range of partners at all levels. In addition, NIDIS offers webinars of relevance to the nation and the regional drought early warning systems. A few upcoming regional webinars are listed on this slide. To register for these and other NIDIS webinars, or if you're interested in learning more about NIDIS or accessing a range of drought data, tools, and information, please visit drought.gov. The address is on the bottom of your screen. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Rebecca with our thanks for sharing the integrated water portal with us. 
Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, great. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm excited to, to talk today about the integrated um, water portal, which is a, a tool that my office, um, the State Climate Office of North Carolina, um, has provided for about five years. Um, so a little background on the integrated water portal. Um, it's designed to bring together different types of data into kind of this one-stop shop, um, specifically to bring together point data, um, on the ground precipitation data, um, surface water data, as well as gridded data uh, in the form of precipitation and drought index grids um, to be able to, to help monitor drought. Um, when the tool was initially developed, we also had a third component um, to incorporate experimental reservoir forecasts um, for seasonal and monthly planning for, for reservoirs in North Carolina. Um, that project has since um, gone away and the, the forecasts aren't being updated. So today I'm really just going to focus on the, the sort of monitoring component of the integrated water portal. Um, so the, the goal of this, uh, when we developed it, was to create, as I said, this, this one-stop shop, but to make it a map. Um, at the time, a lot of the things that were available were very tabular, very um, graphical, but but not really map-based. Initially, they would have sort of static images of maps, but we wanted something that felt very, very GIS um, heavy that somebody could go and the specific needs that we wanted to support with this were drought monitoring and forecasting. Um, and, and our audiences were at the local level. So we worked closely with different groups in North Carolina and a few others across the Southeast, looking at water supply and natural resource managers um, at these state levels, basin levels, and even ecosystem levels. So the portal itself uh, the development was funded by the Water Resources Research Institute in North Carolina, the Department of Environmental Quality, um, at the time it was the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, as well as the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, so we really had this, this local um, support to make it happen. Uh, but it wasn't, um, these weren't the only groups that were involved. So the data that the portal at the time we knew and, and still today provides was supported through um, several research grants from USDA and NOAA, um, as well as just incorporating data from different sources, such as PRISM, the National Weather Service, and USGS. And so we really have all these different groups that were, were involved in, in making this a possibility. We also worked closely, as I said, with different stakeholders in North Carolina to develop, to, to conceptualize what this should be, what, how it would be used, um, and then and then to test it as we were developing it. So some of those key ones I want to recognize are the Water Consortium, which is 12 different public water supply utilities uh, located in North Carolina, um, who are very instrumental. The North Carolina Drought Management Advisory Council. Um, this is an interagency council um, full of volunteers who monitor for the state of North Carolina, um, and so they were they were very very helpful to make this a possibility. So the, the portal itself, um, that URL there at the top will take you to it. Um, like I said, it's a map-based tool. It's built on open layers. Across the top um, are three different tabs. On the left side is a metadata. So this would be to explore um, which you know, stations have data for a certain period, um, or if you want to learn more about specific stations, such as how long have they been around, um, where can you go to um, find their exact location or even the originator for the data since we are pulling it in from um, sources such as USGS. Um, and that was one of the things that was requested was to be able to not just see data, but see where did that data come from. I'm gonna skip over that observed data tab for a second. Um, the about tab on the top is just to, a little bit of background on the portal um, as well as how to, how to use it. Um, and then we do have a download um, option there to download the maps. Um, or graphs that are created, um, as well as some of that point data. So the, the observed data tab is the one that is the most um, used um, and the one that got the most um, attention throughout development and, and in some subsequent iterations. Um, and so the menu on the left of the map is what you would see if you were to um, uh, come to this, this page to view um, observed data. 
you can control um, when you want to view data for so it would be up to the current date um, or you can go back historically for as long as we do have data available um, and then underneath that data layers tab you could pick from different point based layers um, as well as as gridded layers um, so just to give an example um, a recent example of how um, is looking at precipitation across North Carolina. This map's now zoomed in there. Um, I had one day accumulated precipitation from different uh, surface stations across the region. Um, you can see the map how many sites we are doing for the southeast, um, and they are coming from multiple different networks just incorporated here. And in North Carolina, when it comes to drought, especially in the summertime when so much of our precipitation is driven by um, afternoon thunderstorms that are really localized, um, having, having point data is really valuable, but we do still have some gaps. So you can see, um, if you can see my cursor here, just a few places in North Carolina where we really don't have good on the ground representation with what's, what, what's happening. And this was a big gap that the North Carolina Drought Management Advisory Council said was, was really problematic when it came to monitoring drought. And so what we've done is uh, added the ability to overlay, um, or I guess under this case, uh, precipitation. Um, this is coming from the Advanced Hydrologic Prediction Service, or AHAPS, uh, acknowledge that, that we are not creating this gridded product. Uh, here we are um, pulling it in the weather service. Um, but it has been very helpful to be able to um, see these different sources of data together to then be able to zoom and really um, get a clearer picture of where exactly have we received rain, where exactly have we not received rain, um, how quickly are things uh, changing. Um, so I uh, kind of glossed over this before, but I did want to, since it really loops into the integrated water portal, portal um, about the time that we were developing this uh, tool, we were also developing a series of gridded drought indices. Um, and so I've listed these here, uh, the Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, the SPI blend, which is um, a, a weighted SPI that, that gives more weight to more recent precipitation, the Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index, uh, the Keech Byron Drought Index. Um, th those four indices my office produces um, every day, actually, um, for the entire lower 48 states um, for a series of, of time goals. And then from the National Weather Service, we are also pulling in percent of normal and departure from normal precipitation. So all of these groups are available through the water portal um, each day going back to um, 2005. So we have a lot of this data available. Um, and, and just a recent example of how we've been able to use this, um, going back to 2016, um, we had uh, on in early October of that year uh, along the Eastern seaboard, Hurricane Matthew um, came and brought quite a bit of, of precipitation and, and we had associated flooding that lasted for um, several weeks. Um, and I, I, the legend on the bottom, sorry, it's a little bit cut off, um, but we were watching conditions um, over the Western part of North Carolina and, and really much Southeast um, after Hurricane Matthew, when we really just didn't receive any precipitation, um, we, we had quite a pronounced dry spell, um, and it and it was pretty warm. So we were watching how this dryness was starting to creep eastward in North Carolina um, to really get a sense of, you know, have we returned to drought conditions in the central part of the state, or are we still wet enough? following those rains from Hurricane Matthew, even though we've had a couple of months of dryness. And so being able to overlay other data on top of this, such as stream flow, um, such as soil moisture, such as groundwater, this has been really helpful to be able to track um, different indicators to really get at that convergence of evidence that is so important for, for drought monitoring. So that's just been a, a very helpful thing. Um, and we can, um, view for each time you overlay a station you can view the the time um, and then just lastly it is a, a national product um, these uh, the grid so you can view them for the lower 48 states um, I will say that the they do use ahaps precipitation so um, there are some ICs with that um, some known errors once you get over the intermountainous west um, but we'll we'll leave that to, to sort of the local judgment. Um, 
So uh, as it was kind of mentioned in the introduction, so the, the integrated water portal has been around for about five years. Um, and it was initially um, developed with support from some, some grants. Um, and the, the products that it displays are also um, were supported by some grants. And those, um, as, as happened, those grants have gone away. And so we're, we've been looking at ways to support this long term. Um, we're currently just um, supporting it with a little bit of, of state funds. And, and that's not really something that we can continue to do. So we sent out a survey to the US Drought Monitor listserv in April of this year um, to get a sense of who exactly is using the integrated water portal. How is it useful? Um, you know, if, if it were to go away, what would be that gap? Um, but then also just to get an idea of you know, where are the needs still when it comes to, to tools to support drought monitoring? And so we had a really great response rate. Um, uh, we had people who replied from the federal government, um, from various different agencies, um, state governments from across the country, um, as well as some academic centers. And um, just wanted to share a couple of more kind of uh, synthesized qualitative results here. So we sent it out through um, Qualtrics, and one of the questions we asked was just, how do you use the integrated water portal? Um, and so um, the survey software let me do a, a word cloud, um, and I just thought it was really great to see that it is being used to monitor drought um, on a weekly basis. Um, the responses that came in by and large were that it is one of the first tools that many use to get a, an understanding of, of what that climate system is looking like. Um, how dry are we? Um, and then from there to go and, and explore different things. Um, so that was really helpful to know that that's what we designed it for and it's still being used that way um, even several years later and, and even outside of that geographic domain that we developed it for. Um, and then there were a few other responses that came in that were a little bit surprising um, in a good way that it's, you know, um, droughts kind of the dry side of the hydrologic cycle, but it's also being used to look at that wet side as well. So that was really valuable. Um, and then we um, just briefly asked, you know, what are the things that are most important? And so um, some of those specific layers, um, like the SPEI or things that aren't as widely available were, were really noted. Um, that ability to um, see uh, the temporal and spatial coverage um, to be able to overlay the gridded data and the point data to see things that are updating every day, not just every month, um, as well as to be able to, you know, use it if you're in Oklahoma or North Carolina or Florida um, were noted as really helpful. So most of my take homes, and I'm sure that these are not new for anyone who is on the call today, um, but I just thought, you know, reflecting back on something we developed um, half a decade ago that that it's still really useful today. I think in large part because we had that early stakeholder involvement um, from many different stakeholders, but we were really able to, to come to a consensus on what this tool would be used for, um, what exactly its purpose was, and, and what that would be. Um, and then to know that your can grow. Um, we designed it for the Southeast, but it's now being used across the lower 48. Um, and then I just want to say personally that some of those um, drought indices in here were part of my master's thesis. And it's really exciting to see that something I did for school um, a while ago uh, is, has made such a big difference. So that's, that's been a valuable experience. Um, so with that, I just wanted to say um, thank you. There's that website again, um, my contact information, and I will stop. Thanks, Rebecca. And we do have several questions about um, the, the tool, and we will take those questions at the end of the webinar after all the presentations. Um, and there's clearly interest because several folks asked for the link to the tool. So thanks for sharing that again, Rebecca. And now we'll turn over to Dr. Katherine Higovish. Can you, uh, is, is that, can you hear me? I can, uh, yes, I can hear you. I don't yet see your screen. Oh, can you ask for my screen again uh, to, to transfer the screen? Yes. Oh. 
I'm not getting a message yet. Okay, let me try again. Showing that you're the presenter. Let me. Oh, there you is go. it showing now? Is it showing? Yes. Now? Sorry about yes. that. <clears throat> okay. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Great. Um, and thank you again to NIDAS for inviting me to speak today about the Climate Toolbox, um, which is freely available through a web browser at climatetoolbox.org. Um, the, climate, the Climate Toolbox is a collection of web tools for answering questions related to climate, water, agriculture, and fire danger through summary visualizations available on maps, graphs, graphs and dashboards. And though formally it was called the Northwest Climate Toolbox, um, this toolbox is not just for those in the Northwest USA. Most of the tools show data over the contiguous lower 48 states, as you'll see in my presentation. And you can access the individual tools by clicking the thumbnails from the landing page, uh -oh. like, like so, um, to open the tools in the web browser. Yeah, so this toolbox grew incrementally over the last five years through funding from many different organizations, including NIDAS, the Northwest NOAA RESA CERC, the Northwest CASC, the Northwest Climate Hub, and USDA NIFA. And generally, certain tools were added with each stage of funding, and thus it grew. Um, the core team consists of myself and John Abatsaglu at the University of Idaho, representing the climate data side, and Oriana and Bart at the University of Washington, representing the hydrology data side. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge key contributors over the years, including um, the Northwest Knowledge Network at University of Idaho, which serves up all of our data and provides web services. Also, members of CERC and Holly Hartman have been instrumental with improving the polish of our tools. And finally, Lauren Parker and Mead Crosby's group at the University of Washington helped to develop some individual tools. So to understand how the toolbox can help with drought monitoring, um, I remind you that drought is any deficiency of water in satisfying demand. It can be caused by a decrease in the supply of water, an increase in the demand, or a combination of the two. And there are many types of drought depending on the source or the use of the water supply. So a meteorological drought arises from reduced precipitation. A hydrologic drought arises from reduced water supply in streams, lakes, or groundwater. Um, an agricultural drought comes about when there's reduced water for crops, either due to low soil moisture or increased evapotranspiration. An ecological drought is when there's reduced water for ecosystems, like for forests or fish. And a snow drought happens through reduced snow, snowpack for mountain water storage, which is something we're very familiar with in the Northwest. And there are definitely other types of drought as well. Um, a less commonly heard drought is an energy drought where there's reduced water for hydropower. So the power of the toolbox really comes from the data it's built upon, and we have several data sets available that can be used for monitoring the different types of drought. First, there are the climate and hydrology data sets maintained by the University of Idaho and University of Washington. So at, at UIdaho, we produce GridMet, um, which is a daily gridded climate data set over the contiguous US on a four kilometer grid cells. Um, along with a large set of derived metrics. And this is for the, period, the time period 1979 up until yesterday. So this is real time data. And then the UW uh, uses the GridMet climate data to force the variable infiltration capacity or VIC hydrology model to produce hydrology data like snow water equivalent, soil moisture and runoff. And then second, we now ingest some different data sets from other organizations to support some of our tools. For example, from NRCS, we ingest streamflow, reservoir storage, and snow water equivalent. And from USGS, we ingest streamflow and groundwater levels. And then we have some other organizations that we um, ingest different drought data sets. So for drought monitoring and decision making, the toolbox has both monitoring tools uh, which utilize the different data sets I just described, as well as forecast tools, which utilize sub-seasonal and seasonal forecast data, which we also produce at the University of Idaho in Washington, um, consistent with GridMet and run through that VIC model. Um, so I'm, but I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, show you how a couple of these tools can be used for monitoring the different types of drought. So I'd like to start with meteorological drought as the toolbox has many tools to look at real-time precipitation across the contiguous USA. For example, in the climate mapper tool shown here, 
um, one can look at maps of precipitation either over the last seven days or last 90 days or since October 1st. Um, also, the maps can show either precipitation anomalies from a baseline average, like the mean from 1981 to 2010, or the current percentile rankings amongst past years. So here the Climate Mapper shows a map of real-time summaries of precipitation anomalies for total precipitation since October 1st, which is over the water year, as a percent of the mean from 1981 to 2010. And the blue colors are locations with above normal precipitation, and the brown colors are below normal. And so from the map, we can easily spot regions in which there are particularly wet or dry extreme conditions for the water year. And I clicked on the map around Monte Vista, Colorado, and I see uh, that at that location, it's 46.4% uh, of normal, it's below normal in precipitation for the water year. And using this tool, I can also zoom in to that location to get a better view spatially of the anomalies, where I see here that there are other locations nearby um, that are even drier and with the darker brown. So I can also take a look at the historical climate dashboard tool, which gives a quick glance at, of real-time metrics of your choosing in a dashboard layout. And there are lots of choices for tailoring this dashboard. Um, I just chose precipitation on some different time scales here, current water year, current calendar year, last 30 days and last seven days. Um, and I selected that point location in Monte Vista, Colorado. And in the dashboard, I, actually, I see actual numbers for the precipitation and anomalies, as well as a statement as to how it compares to normal. With, um, and from this dashboard, I can see that the precipitation over the calendar year um, here is record lowest um, since, since January 1st. So I can take that information and go to the historical climate tracker, and I can select... Um, January through April precipitation, which is here. Um, and I can look at the US, I can also look at the US county that contains Monte Vista um, as there's options to, to select the county and even um, a Huck 8 watershed. Um, so I'm looking at the US county and I'm looking at area averages of that April, January through April precipitation to see just how low that record pre precipitation, record low precipitation is. And we see for 20, 20 for 2020 this is um, definitely record low since 1979 um, with a close second in about 2002. And so then I can go over to the seasonal progression tool and I can see how the precipitation actually played out since October 1st over this last water year in a cumulative precipitation graph. And here the red line is the current water year this line here. And for context, um, we have the black line, which is the median from 1979 to 2017, and the gray shading represents the 10 through 90th percentiles from that time period. And these, this gives more context to the red line showing uh, how that progression in precipitation led to that record low at our current, um, current time, um, mainly due to the real decline in precipitation from that January through April time period when it normally grows. Yep. Um, yeah, and so then also in this tool, we can tack on the precipitation forecast. That's so we have here is today, this is the data up until today, but we can tack on the precipitation forecast for the next 30 days, which is the blue line, and also the next seven months, um, which is the yellow line and some shading for the different models that we have, um, just to see how things might recover. And so this also gives, um, provides some information to decision makers. So in summary, um, just from the meteorological drought, through these five tools, we get a pretty good picture of how the meteorological drought is spatially distributed over the region and over, over the U.S. and for a specific location, how it compared to previous years and how it progressed over the months of the water year. So snow drought can also be monitored in, in the toolbox through the Climate Mapper tool um, using April 1st snow water equivalent as a proxy. So I've selected April 1st and uh, snow water equivalent. Um, and that can be used as a proxy for snowpack. Um, so here we have maps of uh, SWE percentile rankings for April 1st, 2020, compared to the years 1981 to 2010. And we can see that there's a record low um, April snowpack here in the Rockies in Montana through the red coloring and the black coloring, which indicates, for the red, indicates the lowest, um, five, that the snowpack is in the lowest 5% of year, years. And the black indicates that uh, current in, in April, 
the SWE was less than 10 millimeters when normally there is snow. So that's kind of indicating that um, level of, of snow drought. And ecological drought can also be monitored in the toolbox. Um, in the Climate Mapper tool, we can look at maps of the energy release component, which is a measure of dryness of natural vegetation and forests. And here we show the current percentiles of ERC um, from amongst 1979 to 2015 and see that there's cons some considerable vegetation dryness um, here in the north. East USA um, through those brown colors indicating that um, the dryness is in the upper 95th percentile of years in past years. And this provides an alert of conditions conducive to wildfires or ecosystem impacts um, for that region. Then hydrologic drought monitoring can be achieved through the historical water watcher tool. And this wa the water watcher allows selection of current percentiles of different water sources and classifies water extremes according to the US drought monitor classification. Uh, this is the tool that has the most drought data sets. It has um, drought data sets for all of the different types of drought. Um, and here we can see also in this tool in the upper right here is the current US drought monitor classification. Um, and we can select a point that we can see what um, the classification is for each metric um, at that point location and also for the US drought monitor. And then in the lower right corner here, we have, see a summary of each of those metrics that we picked, also the US drought monitor, and we see what each of those metrics um, said for drought or for the wet side um, for that location. So, yep. And so here I'm looking at hydrologic water sources for stream flow, for reservoir storage, for groundwater, and total runoff. Um, and I chose a location in the Bitterroots here in Idaho um, in which the U.S. Drought Monitor is class classifying a severe drought. And we see, see support for that in um, that three of the four hydrologic sources that I picked um, somewhat support, support that. We can also do agricultural drought monitoring in the Water Watcher tool. Um, for the agriculture, we can look at potential evapotranspiration. We can look at Palmer Drought Severity Index for soil moisture. There's also some different soil moisture sources, uh, data sources. Um, here I'm showing um, satellite data from GRACE. Um, and also uh, total moisture, which is soil moisture plus snow water equivalent. Um, and each of these gives a slightly different view or a slightly different picture of um, these aspects of drought, either the soil moisture aspect in these three um, or the evapotranspiration aspect in this, in this piece, um, all supporting um, agricultural drought monitoring. And I've selected a point kind of close to that, Monte Vista in Colorado again. The US Drought Monitor puts that location in extreme drought. And when I see the summary, I see um, some definite support again for with the different pieces for that um, classification. Yeah, so in total, the tool, toolbox has some nice features for exploring data sets. Uh, currently, these include dynamic maps that are zoomable and interactable, customizable graphics that are also interactable, um, interactive. Uh, we have location-specific information where you can pick a point location, U.S. counties, or Huck 8 watersheds. We have the ability to browse past data and download data, um, and then also to have some tools that provide data integration across time scales, where real-time data is being compared to past data and real-time data is being extended with forecasts. So all in all, we have a diverse audience for the toolbox, ranging from community members to educators to, com to, um, to communicators, uh, as well as decision makers. And there are likely more that we don't know about, but these are just a smattering of the people um, that we have talk to. And um, something I haven't talked about yet is that the toolbox also has future climate projections in, in, the, in the toolbox. Um, that's not really relevant to the webinar today. But recently, we worked closely with a community um, in Spokane, Washington, who uses the toolbox to create future climate data stories for the region. And they looked at temperature, precipitation, streams, snow, and fire, and are currently in the process of using the toolbox to create a climate vulnerability and re resilience assessment. And through this interaction, uh, CERC worked with us to create a workbook series to help users to access and apply climate information at a local scale to develop relevant resilience actions. And the first workbook in this series is the Northwest Climate Toolbox work Workbook, um, which 
basically helps, uh, goes into detail on how to use the climate data and the tools from the toolbox to create a climate data story. <coughs> and you can access these workbooks um, by going to the climate toolbox, the guidance section um, through this link or the, the guidance section of the toolbox, and that can help you to use the toolbox. So finally, um, I don't have a crystal ball, but currently we have a pretty solid framework for displaying maps and summer graphs in the toolbox and also the ability to scale and add new tools. Um, and I believe we'll continue to grow as we have been through adding new data sets, different derived variables and new tools. And I know in the pipeline for next year are the development of forecast information um, and putting these this information into tools and also um, developing more drought tools. Um, uh, primarily through new NIDIS funding for the next years. And that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. And um, now we're going to um, hear from Jeff Marty about how he and the state of Washington uses the climate toolbox in drought monitoring. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Catherine, as well. Um, can everyone hear me okay and see my screen? Looks good, yep, thank you. Great, great. Um, well, some of you may be wondering um, why they picked the guy from Washington State to talk about drought tools, because um, we do have kind of a reputation as being sort of the moss people. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to share a little factoid for you. Um, Seattle receives eight fewer inches of rain um, per year than Raleigh, uh, North, Dakota, or, uh, North Carolina. So um, I often wonder, you know, how can people stand to live there? Um, but in fact, uh, most of our precipitation that we do get falls during the late fall through early spring, and our summers are quite dry and uh, very pleasant. Um, but this is also our growing season, and when our out of stream water demand is at its highest uh, due to irrigation of crops and uh, turf grass. And of course, we still need to meet all our other water demands like drinking water and keeping enough water in our rivers to sustain our salmon. And to meet all those needs, we are very dependent on the mountain snow melting in the spring and filling our reservoirs and rivers. And if we don't have good snowpack, um, you heard Catherine use the phrase snow drought, um, we can have water supply shortage issues. Um, for example, streams can get too low for salmon to migrate and farmers can lose access to water for irrigation. So just a bit of background on Washington's drought process. Um, essentially, we have uh, two parts to designating a drought in Washington state. Uh, one is a consideration of physical conditions like water supply, forecast, uh, snowpack, precipitation, and soil moisture. And the other is a consideration of the economic health and environmental consequences of any water supply uh, shortages, the hardships. Um, as you might imagine, we have committees responsible for making these determinations. One is full of technical experts, that's our State Water Supply Availability Committee, or WASAC, and the other is more executive level, our Executive Water Emergency Committee, or EWEC, that looks at the, you know, the environmental and economic consequences of the uh, shortages. Um, and it's important in both contexts to be able to quickly share information about current and expected uh, conditions. And so as Catherine just demonstrated, the toolbox gives us an excellent way to do that pr by providing conditions and forecast in pre presentation uh, ready formats. So what happens when Washington State declares drought? Um, basically a drought declaration triggers a formal state response where the Department of Ecology is authorized to take certain actions, um, which you can see summarized here. Uh, the key thing is that we're authorized to process requests for emergency water rights and water right transfers. Okay. All right, on to the toolbox. Um, so I mentioned that snowpack is critical to our water supply. Um, and probably more than 70% of our runoff, annual runoff from the Cascades actually originates as snowpack. Um, so I'd like to show you how the toolbox helps us keep tabs on that. Um, for decades, you know, the go-to source for snowpack information has been the Snowtel network uh, operated by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, there are more than 700 snowtel sites across the Western US, and we have about 74 snowtel stations in Washington state. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that we don't have snow tell coverage in every watershed where we expect snow, and that can lead to some gaps in coverage. 
So here, you have two maps. On the left, you see a map from NRCS, which shows three snow tell stations sort of clustered on the northeast side of the Olympic Peninsula. Um, but there are no stations on the west and the uh, southwest flank, so parts of the Olympics can be a bit of a mystery uh, when it comes to snowpack. The, uh, the Climate Toolbox, however, provides a gridded coverage that includes all the various watersheds which drain from the Olympic Peninsula, and that's the map you see on the right. It shows the April 1st snowpack expressed as a percentile relative to historic conditions. So that's uh, very nice and important to have. You know, it's a more complete uh, textured picture of snowpack than otherwise would be available based on individual station data. So it makes a really nice complement to the NRCS data. And then the same is true for other parameters like precipitation, temperature, soil moisture, um, et cetera. So um, as part of my job, uh, draw coordinator for ecology, um, I'm expected to stay ahead of the curve um, when it comes to drought development. You know, I don't like it when drought sneaks up on me. Um, don't think my managers like it either. Um, so I try to stay super attentive to whether precipitation deficits may be developing. Um, but I also don't like to overreact to a dry spell, you know, if wetter conditions are on the horizon. So I don't want to be, you know, overly twitchy. Um, so I'm always kind of looking for that sweet spot between being Rip Van Winkle or Chicken Little. And this slide um, highlights how easy it is to determine the extent of both the observed and forecasted anomalies using the climate toolbox. Um, you know, different time frames um, and different parameters. And this includes uh, variables like precipitation, temperature, uh, evapotranspiration, and also hydrologic variables like snow water equivalent and soil moisture. And uh, here are our results here. Um, on the left, you know, we have the precipitation anomaly for the last 15 days. That shows you where we've been in the recent past. And on the right, where we're going based upon the forecast, a precipitation anomaly forecast for the next two weeks. Um, so I'm a, you know, I'm a drought and a water supply guy. So I don't merely want to know if it's going to rain. I want to know, is it going to rain more or less than normal for this time of year? because that'll help me understand whether any precipitation deficits are going to get worse or better. Uh, the forecast precipitation anomaly for the next 15 days is on the right. Now that indicates to me mostly normal to below uh, normal precipitation for the next couple of weeks. So I would not expect a significant recovery in central Washington, but perhaps some modest improvement in um, southwest Washington. And I don't see um, danger signs of drying in the, uh, the southeast corner of the state. So one last note about these uh, anomaly maps is I really like how you can zoom in to an area that you care about. Um, and that stands in contrast to some other products where the scale of your map might be the entire United States or North America. And it might be kind of hard to tell exactly, you know, which parts of your state uh, are affected. So um, I'm assuming that many of you um, like me, um, you know, work for organizations which are primarily concerned with uh, water supply conditions in a particular area, uh, not necessarily an entire state or the country as a whole. Um, in Washington, my own agency establishes water management rules for specific watersheds. Uh, and in these watersheds, there can be a range of organizations which need to track um, conditions for their own purposes. You know, you have fish managers, irrigation districts, utilities, and so forth. So here, um, for example, is a scatter plot for a particular watershed, uh, the Meta watershed in North Central Washington, and it drains off the east side of the North Cascades. And this plot compares the average February through April uh, maximum daily temperature to total precipitation over that time period um, as averaged over the entire watershed. And precipitation is on the y-axis and temperature is on the x-axis. So you can see that this year, 2020, the the bright red dot uh, is definitely on the dry side, a little over four inches of rain over a three month period. Um, and this is, uh, you know, for relative, uh, those other dots go back to 1979. So that's a very useful context, you know, especially if you know 
um, what kind of impacts were observed in other years on a scatter plot, um, and if you if you knew that you had you know water supply problems or issues in those in those other years. So now that we know the uh, Meta watershed is in a bit of a hole precipitation wise, we can also use the climate toolbox to assess the probability of getting out of that hole. Um, and this is something that Catherine showed previously as well. Um, this is the historical seasonal progression tool. And so what you see is the precipitation accumulation for the current water year, the red line, uh, compared to the historic distribution um, for the town of Winthrop located in the, in the Metau River Valley. So you can see for this year, this area is below the 10th percentile. Um, I would say that qualifies as dry. Um, and what's the forecast say? The seasonal progression tool allows you to append a forecast to our accumulation line. Uh, here I've selected the 30-day forecast. That's the blue line that extends past the dotted vertical line labeled as today. And that the 30-day forecast is based upon the, uh, the CFS um, version two ensemble. Um, so the good news, rain is on the way. Um, we can see some increase in accumulation. Uh, the sad news is that after 30 days, um, this area is still likely to be in the bottom 10th percentile of water year precipitation. So the odds for recovery over the next 30 days um, are pretty low um, given the current forecast. Okay, so this is actually my presentation. Um, I did want to conclude, um, so, you know, I barely scratched the surface of the utility of the toolbox for, um, uh, for drought and water supply monitoring. Um, but if you are someone who either needs to, you know, consume climate data yourself um, or you're responsible for communicating it or producing it for other folks within your own organizations um, or with the public, uh, you know, the toolbox would be well worth checking out. So uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Jeff. That was uh, super interesting. And thank you all for your presentations. We have a whole lot of questions here. Um, and I am going to try to group them because uh, quite a few of them are similar. Um, so several questions are asking about why these uh, two tools are uh, limited to the lower 48 states and why Alaska and Hawaii aren't included and what will it take to include Alaska and Hawaii and if there might be a timeline for including Alaska and Hawaii. And I can take that one, um, Ms. Catherine. Um, the reason that we don't have um, Alaska in these tools um, is that the coverage of station data is pretty sparse and um, also the period of record is um, not very long for the locations that they do have. So um, it's somewhat difficult to make gridded data products in such a situation. Um, there are, there are, there is still satellite data covering those areas, um, but a lot of times with satellite data, um, it has to be run through a model still, um, and then biases have to be removed, and the way we remove biases is using ground truth station da uh, data on the ground. And so if we don't have good ground data or it's really um, patchy, not not very many stations, we can't really do that bias correction, and so we don't really have good data. Um, and that's that's the answer for Alaska. Um, I don't really know what the answer is for Hawaii, um, but I think, but I kind of assume it's similar. Um, yeah, maybe the period of record is not as long, and to get good statistics, we need a longer period of record for our um, ground station data to remove those biases from um, model data. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Rebecca, did you want to add anything to that response, or is it similar for the integrated water portal? Yeah, I, I would say it's it's similar. We're we're coming in probably a little bit farther down the, the the data line and using data that's originating with other groups. That's the the grid of data, and then from there, manipulating it to calculate drought indices. And and for this for the similar reasons that um, Catherine said, they are only available for the lower 48. Um, so that's that's our limitation there. Okay, thanks. Um, a few people are asking again for the links to the website. So would you mind if I 
I'd turn the presentation back over to Rebecca for a couple minutes to share that link and then Catherine for a few minutes to share the link. Would that be okay? Sure. Since I don't have it up on this side. Okay. Sure. Um, let's see. We could also put them in the chat if you wanted yeah. to do that. Like we yes, could do it that'd be the, great. We could do perfect. it to the whole um, the whole audience. That'd be perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, grab another question here. Are data sets for reservoir and lake level data in these toolboxes in addition to stream flow and related data sets discussed? I'm so sorry, I was typing. Could you repeat that question? Um, about whether reservoir and lake level data is also in the tools. Gotcha. Um, I, for the water portal, we do have that data um, that we're able to get from sources like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for reservoir levels, as well as groundwater from USGS and North Carolina Division of Water Resources. So we do we do have that data available. Um, all the the station observations that the integrated water portal provides are for they're limited to the southeastern United States, though, so they those will not be national. Mm -hmm. Catherine? And then in the toolbox, um, we do have the, in the, in the water watcher, um, in the toolbox, um, we have the hydrologic, logical drought metrics like that. So we have reservoir levels and stream flows and groundwater. Um, yeah, so we do have that and it's available for as much as the USGS um, has available. So mostly it's the entire United States. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. And Catherine, while while we have you here on the map layers, can individual counties be overlaid? Yes, they can. There's an option to where you click and you um you click and you can overlay the state boundaries or the or the counties, U.S. counties or the HUC eight watersheds as well. So yes, you can overlay those. All right, thank you. Um, what about economic and social drought? I guess the question here is, is is data on the impacts of economic and social drought, is that integrated in any in either of the portals? And for, so for right now, we don't have that in the climate toolbox. Um, we actually might have a project with NIDAS um, for next year and the next two years, um, looking at the economic impact for um, on recreation um, from drought. So that's a tool to look for in the future. Um, but there's nothing right now on impacts, drought impacts in the toolbox. I was going to mention that the, the National Drought Mitigation Center has a uh, drought impact reporter, um, and they have been refining their tools over the past couple of years to allow um, anyone really to um, submit an observation of, uh, of drought conditions. Um, and that's so that's very important and I would and uh, and we at the state level um, after we've gone through a drought event we usually write up a summary um, of impacts that that we know about uh, during that year and also the you know, the various activities that occurred to to respond to the drought so it's important to do all right thanks um, oh I see so a, f a few folks are saying they're not getting the links to um, they're not getting the links that you shared. I think it was sent just to the organizers. So if you wouldn't mind resharing those, and at the bottom um, where it says to uh, click entire audience, not organizers only. I could do it, also do it real fast, or yeah, maybe Adam, you wouldn't mind doing that. I don't think I have that option. Yeah, we don't have that option. Oh, okay. Adam, would you mind resharing those links um, to the entire audience? Yep, I'll take Thanks care of everyone it. everyone for letting us know. Yep. Um, okay, can you overlay tribal reservation boundaries? Mm -hmm. We actually have a tool in the toolbox that it's called the tribal climate tool. I didn't discuss it today. Um, that has reservation boundaries in it for tribes um, for the Northwest and Great Basin tribes. Um, but these are only for future pro projections. Um, I think that's something that we could do some someday. Um, but currently, right now, in the rest of the tool, tools in the toolbox, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. 
And Rebecca, is that something you can do? Yeah, so, so likewise we don't have it, but that, that is something that we would be able to overlay. Okay. Um, and a few folks asked about the recording. So um, the recording will be placed onto NIDIS's YouTube channel and everyone who registered for the webinar will get a notice when that recording is available. Um, can the data be downloaded by HUC or administrative boundary? And in the toolbox, um, for all of the graphical tools, yes, it can. So there's, um, if you select a HUC or a, um, a county or a state, you're going to get a graph for um, area averages for those. And in the upper corner of any of those graphs, you can actually download the data in Excel format or CSV format, or you can actually download the graph also in picture format. Okay, really cool. thanks, Catherine. We, we cannot do that in the integrated water portal. Um, we, you can download any of the station data, um, and we temporarily took it down while we're doing some maintenance, but um, it should be back up within the next few days. Um, the ability to just download the entire gridded data sets. So. Great. All right, thanks. And Jeff, uh, there was a question on what was the organization that you said included the economic drought information? Was it, were you speaking to the National Drought Mitigation Center? Was that? Yep, that's, yep, exactly. Now the one based in Lincoln. So it's a National Drought Mitigation Center, and you were referring to the um, impact. Um, right, the uh, right, impact. drought impact report or DIR. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's NDMC at yep. um, University and of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And they have a database. You, they can uh, get data exports on uh, impacts by state and uh, and county, I believe. You know, for historically. So. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, um, Rebecca, there was a question um, on in your about your presentation. Are you using Cocoa Ros for drought monitoring, or do your sources use Cocoa Ros data? Yeah, so That's we a citizen science. Maybe you yeah. just want to explain what Cocoa Ros is. Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. So when I showed that map of the station-based precipitation, um, we do incorporate Cocoa Ros just to get a sense of where has precipitation fallen in that short term time scale, especially when we have um, a big event come through like a hurricane. Cocoa Ros has been really um, incredibly helpful. Um, for, for longer term, um, we're not really calculating any sort of statistics with it. Um, we're just looking at observations from Cocoa Ros um, and then comparing that to other surface data um, as well as the gridded products. It has been um, incredibly helpful, and, and I, I can't remember if we said the, what it stands for. It's the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. Um, we do use the Kokoraz Condition Monitoring. Um, these are uh, weekly reports that Kokoraz observers submit that are observations of um, just what's going on around them um, to get an, a baseline understanding of the, the moisture status. Um, it's kind of similar to the drought impact reporter, but um, through Kokoraz. And those we do use each week to, to really get to um, on the ground impact reports. Great, thank you. Um, there are several more questions. I don't wanna keep anybody longer if you need to um, leave, if you have something else um, happening in a minute, but um, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes if you all have time. Sure. Sure. Jeff, are you able to stay on, or do you yeah, need to? Yeah, yeah I okay, can stay. Great. No one, Thank you. No one invited me to lunch. So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Um, this uh, is referring to your presentation, Catherine. Can you explain what precipitation anomaly means in the map? Is it a relative value or absolute value? For example, if the anomaly value is 90. Does it mean the precipitation is 90 higher than a normal value? How do, de how do you determine the normal value? Yeah, that, that is correct, actually. So you take the, the, it's, um, you take the total precipitation and you subtract the mean of uh, that's the precip precipitation from that same time period from 
a set of historical years. So from 1981 to 2010, normally we take like 30 years to assess like a climatology. So yes, um, if the total precipitation, if you subtract the mean, if it's 90, it's a positive value, then it's above the mean. It's above average, it's above normal. Yeah, does that answer the question? I think it does. Yeah, thanks. Um, Rebecca, this question is for you about, you mentioned errors in the West. Um, if you could talk a little bit about, more about those, the kind of errors and what those are. Sure, and this, this has to do with the, that input data set that we're using, um, the quantitative precipitation estimates from the National Weather Service. Um, it's a, a precipitation map that um, has radar data as its input, and so, um, and then it's bias adjusted using surface observations. And so because the density of radars and the density of stations are, are less in that part of the country, it's, um, it's just harder to get as accurate an estimate on the ground as we do in the Eastern part of the country where we do have a higher density. Um, and we, we generated the product to be national because that's the, the data set that, sorry, the, for the lower 48 states, um, because that's what we were able to get. Um, but we, we do recognize that there are some, some biases that it can accumulate in um, over or underestimating precipitation, especially when you get to longer term time scales. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question here. If, um, are there any tools that detect the resilience of reservoirs with climate? I think it's climate variability. I think you'd have to go to the, um, like in our tools, we don't, we just look at percentiles from reservoir levels, um, but NRCS does have that data. Um, and you could look at, you could look at the reservoir levels over a long, lots of historical years, um, maybe to kind of look at how it's changed over time and see if um, the reservoirs are resilient to the precipitation that it's coming in now. Um, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, someone is curious how the tools were developed. Were they developed in-house by contractor? If you could share like how long it took to develop them. I know you talked a little bit about how both tools have uh, changed over time and uh, you're working to address stakeholder needs. Maybe you could just share a little bit more about uh, the development of them. Um, I can go first. Um, this is Rebecca. Um, so yeah, so I was the developer for the integrated water portal. Um, I, I did all of the programming for it. Um, and it took probably, you know, from start to finish um, about a year and a half. Um, you know, it wasn't 100% of my time in that period. Um, and we scheduled fairly frequent meetings with our different stakeholders, probably once every um, three months or so. Um, and then as it became more developed, more in-person meetings where we were walking through the tool, walking through how it was being used um, to, to make decisions in, in sort of a hypothetical way. Yeah, and I can go. Um, yeah. So for developing the toolbox, um, we've been developing it for the last five years. It was developed with small bits of um, funding from different organizations and um, it grew kind of tool by tool um, and yeah um, and again it's not also my full-time job to develop these tools I also do a lot of data analysis and management of data um, but yeah it's been five years and um, yeah and there's always a question about maintainability of these kind of tools both the data sets and the tools going forward um, yeah, it's a, it's a big investment. Um, so it's good that uh, we, we have um, organizations that can help us maintain them. All right, thanks for sharing that. Um, Rebecca, is Texas A&M University still involved in the project in um, the Climate Toolbox? And if so, how? Um, for the integrated water portal, um, so they were involved in the grants that we had to develop the um, gridded SPI, SPI blend, and SPEI. Um, so that was the involvement that we had with them. The portal itself was developed through um, local um, 
uh, projects that we had with the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality and the Water Resources Research Institute. So um, we're not as heavily involved with Texas A&M anymore, but we do still consider them collaborators um, uh, in developing those drought indices. All right, thanks. And I apologize, I misspoke. I called that the climate toolbox. Um, do you have anecdotal examples of how farmers have used some of these tools or utilities? Um, someone is interested in using tools like this on small, local scale, real world applications. So I think it's a question about scale. Have you guys, do you guys, are you familiar with the application of these tools at a, at a lower, lower scale, small communities, farmers? Yeah, and I can start. Um, we actually, one of the projects that Start, started the, the toolbox or started many tools was um, a, the REACH project, which is a wheat cap. Um, and so it's wheat, grow, wheat growers in our local area here on the Palouse um, in eastern um, Washington State and Idaho. Um, and we actually interacted with um, some farmers and developed the tools for the local use. And that's one of the reasons why we have so many graphs and um, graphs that you can pick a location um, or you can do the county, but the county and the Huck, Huck watersheds came later. It was first just a point location. Um, and we can use the, some of the tools that um, could be used for a farmer application is we have growing degree days. Um, this is an agricultural application. So it's growing degree days. Um, it's similar to that seasonal, that's in that seasonal progression tool that I showed with the cumulative um, precipitation. You can do cumulative growing degree days and certain levels of, there's thresholds um, on growing degree days that correspond to um, cycles in a crop. So it's like when the wheat is, um, first getting its new leaves, it's the phenology of the wheat, so, or when it's um, going to seed. And so you can use it, you can use that tool actually, to, and the forecast also, to predict when a harvest might be, or when, um, or to see, you know, um, when uh, the, the farmers might need to spray um, or fertilize. So um, that was one application that's anecdotal for agriculture that you can use, be used for decision making. Okay, thanks. You know, we have a similar question here about the application for businesses. Um, and I, I, I suppose that's a wide range of uh, possible businesses, but again, I think the scale would be small, like maybe rafting businesses or skiing businesses, or um, I'm thinking outdoor recreation here, or but other applications for businesses. Have you all, are you familiar with the tools being used for businesses? Uh, the only one that I've heard is that um, in the Northwest here, skiing is big. Um, and we have had some interactions with um, ski resorts um, that have been trying to look at our tools, both for the forecasts and for just the gridded data because they don't have, um, they um, long period of records too. And so they've been trying to use our tools to um, look at precipitation or precipitation forecasts. Um, that's an application. Okay. Um, and Rebecca? Yeah, so we, um, the integrated water portal um, to my knowledge, especially with our survey that we sent out, hasn't been used um, at that local level level. It's really, um, it was geared more towards, and it looks like it continues to be used by um, state agencies um, or regional drought um, coordinating groups to, to assess current conditions on the ground. Um, the most, I guess, local scale has been um, several National Weather Service uh, forecast offices had um, so that they they use it just to help with some of that situational awareness when it comes to drought. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thanks. A question here, I think it's for you, Rebecca. How is energy release calculated? Is it precipitation deficit or some me measure of vegetative response? Yeah, so that question's for me. So it's the energy release component, Sorry. the ERC, which is a fire danger metric. Mm -hmm. um, it is calculated, um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if I can answer this question very well. There's there's some, um, it's, a, it's a standard model, an NFDRS model for um, calculating fire danger. And it's, it's used to um, 
it's used in creating some fire danger metrics that are um, used for like Smoky Bear fire danger signs in the U.S. parks. Um, so it's kind of a standard model and it takes in um, lots of different daily uh, climate data. So it's probably has precipitation or so it's a me measure of vegetation dryness. So um, I think it assumes that there's a, a dense forest on the land um, and then it simulates how the forest would dry out um, with the accumulation over of, of the climate over a time period. So there's a, there's a standard model for this um, and that's how it's calculated. It's basically our daily grid met data gets fed into that model and produces energy release component um, for, for the different locations. All right, thanks Catherine. Is the resolution of the gridded indices four kilometers by four kilometers? Yes. All right. Great. And the same, the same in ours as well. Okay, thanks. Um, oh yes, somebody did point that out. Thank you. Um, it was pointed out that what uh, we were calling the drought impact reporter is now called the condition monitoring drought report, Seymour. Um, so the Seymour drought report. It's still at NDMC. Um, the National Drought Mitigation Center's site um, for posting drought impacts. So thank you for pointing that out. It is condition monitoring drought report now. All right. Um, let's see. There's a request here, Jeff, to provide a link to the Washington drought legislation. Um, what I can do is give you this person's contact after the webinar so you can provide that information. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And quite a few folks are very thankful for your presentations. I'll read one comment here um, to leave us with. These tools are so very helpful and user-friendly when determining locations for flooding and hurricane response, also helping to determine locations of vulnerable um, populations and those likely to need specific types of assistance. Also super helpful to identify communities that might be open to education preparation, mitigation training sessions and programs. Um, so a lot of folks have said, thank you so much for your presentations. And um, I, I would love to take more of your questions. I think I can follow up with some of you after the webinar, but I don't wanna keep folks too long here. So thank you again, Rebecca, Catherine and Jeff for sharing the tools and your expertise. Um, it's been incredibly um, wonderful to hear about these different tools and how they're being used in drought monitoring. So thank you everyone for joining us and um, take care everybody. And thanks again for your presentations.